Hi, David Yout here. I'm going to present an introduction to Ghidra, and I'll be demonstrating some of Ghidra's capabilities by using it to evaluate the copy protection schemes of two 1980s floppy disk-based computer games. In the process, I'll be showing how to extend Ghidra's functionality with things that helps with this analysis task, such as custom scripts, a custom binary loader, a custom analyzer, and I'll show how to make extensions to the CPU's instructions definitions as well. This talk will not assume that you have any knowledge of Ghidra or 8-bit software, but it'll assume that you've had some exposure to one or more assembly languages. So what is Ghidra? Ghidra is an open source reverse engineering tool released by the National Security Agency back in 2019. It is under active development and has a nice community around it. It has great features. It supports many different chip architectures. It of course gives you disassemblies, but it also does decompilation to a C-like language. It offers live debugging, which I will not be showing, but it also does static code emulation, which I will be showing. And it's designed to be extensible to whatever your use cases are. The most easy way to extend it is with either Jython or Java scripting. Uh, you can also have it read custom binary formats, both for importing and exporting. Uh, and you can also even provide brand new processors and architectures and have Ghidra work on that and have the decompiler work on that. So Ghidra supports the family of 6502 processors. This was a very important processor in the late 1970s and early 80s, for, especially for home computer systems. Uh, it is simple to learn. The chip itself, 6502, only has 3,500 transistors on it, so it looks great on a poster. And we're going to be looking today at the Commodore 64, which you see there on the left. That has 6510 processor, which is almost exactly a 6502. And the floppy drive on the right, which had its own processor, a 6502 so that you could send code to it for independent execution. If you're Gen X, this is what an amazing Christmas morning looked like in 1983. So here's the 6510 on the Commodore 64. It's a 6502 with just some extra IO pins on it. Uh, the chip ran at one megahertz. The data width is eight bit, so the registers we're gonna use can only count up to 255 before wrapping back around to zero. Uh, it's 16 bit addressing width. It has a 256 byte stack and it's little Indian, meaning the least significant byte comes before the most significant byte when you're constructing addresses. Again, this is a simple chip. There's only 56 instructions. We're not even gonna be looking at nearly half of these and I'll explain them as I go along. It's, it's quite simple. The instruction size is anywhere from one to three bytes. The first byte specifies the operator, including the dressing mode. And if there is operand bytes, that will either be an immediate value, some constant for it to act on, or an address, eight or 16 bit. Likewise, the registers and the flags are also very simple. There's three general purpose 8-bit registers, the accumulator X and Y, and then there's status flags such as it's negative or it's zero or the carry, just like a normal uh, CPU today. And like other machine languages, instructions set flags and flags in turn change the behavior of instructions. It's just there for statefulness. We won't worry about the other kinds of flags. So before we get into the copy protection schemes, I want to give a real quick intro to Ghidra and to some 6502 assembly. If you don't have Ghidra, you can uh, download it from ghidra-sre.org. You might be required to install a more recent version of Java. Let's create a new project, uh, not shared with others. We will call this uh, this talk and create a folder in there. And we'll call that a uh, quick overview. Okay, now let's load a little sample program into there, nested loop. And I mean, if this was a PE or L file or whatever, Ghidra would have clearly recognized that, but this is a Commodore file it doesn't recognize. So the least common denominator here is raw binary. And uh, in this case, we have to choose what the language, what the processor is, I choose 6502. And there's various options. Uh, I can give it a name like code example. I'm not going to bother to set the base address of the file offset or anything like that. We're just going to bring it in. So sorry that didn't fit in the record screen. Let me scrunch that up. And just some details about the load. And once you open it, it will always ask you if you want to analyze now. The answer is almost always yes. Uh, these are the analyzers. They're individual analyzers. They can build off each other. They take a look at the code. They can be... Um, designed to respond to changes in code or when it's just loaded. Uh, you can add your own if you need them. We're just going to stick with the default set here. So just click Analyze. And so, okay, here we are. We're inside Ghidra. Let's take a quick little look around. This is the program tree area. You can see our code example is here. This is our memory map, basically. Ghidra also created a stack for us as well, that stack block. If you wanted 
uh, mess with the memory map blocks, you can come and add them or modify them here. We'll just turn on execute on stack for fun. Okay. Also in the panels, you can see all your simple tree stuff here. And, um, but otherwise there's, there's not a lot of panels that come up by default and there's many up here, for instance, like here's a binary editor. I could go in and uh, look at the binary and edit it. Look at that. That's so very few bytes in this example, tiny program, which can pack a lot of 6502 instructions in something very tiny. The Ghidra people have a nice sense of humor. If you continually try to open a panel that's already open, it will start to shake and try to get your attention saying, Hey, look at just this thing over here. There's a lot of effects. That's, I don't know, I think it's fun. So let me close this. What we're going to do is disassemble this so I can highlight and say select all. Right click and say disassemble or just press the D key. And there's our little program. So this first line is at uh, memory offset zero because we didn't specify a base address, right? And so you have the byte A2 and then the byte 10. The byte A2 is this LDX command, load the X register. And the 10 is a... You can see this by this pound sign in front of it. That's immediate mode, meaning that as a constant hex 10 is going to this is going to operate on that constant. So Ghidra has automatically created some flows here that we can see. Um, these are these indicated the nested loop flows, so we know it's a nested loop. Uh, we get cross references right off the bat too, so we can see that there was a jump to here from uh, memory location 000a down here. We have J in parentheses, that means jump. Had that been R, that would have been a cross-reference read. Had that been W, that would have been a cross-reference write. And that's going to be super handy later on for showing where self-modifying code is coming from. We get this label here called lab0002, again 0002 because that's the memory location. Uh, lab is the prefix that Ghidra shows for flows that aren't calls. This is just a branch that took us up there. Had that been sub, it'd be subroutine or dat for data or fun for function. And we can click and change these labels if we want to. So I'm just going to say um, edit label, shortcut is L. So we'll call this I don't know, outer loop. And we can come to this one and I'll just press L and call this one inner loop. Um, and you can see that's been respected in these branch statements here. So of course the cognitive burden keeps going down the more you label things and go along. <clears throat> So as I think I might have said, LDX means load X. So we're going to be loading X with the value of 10. If I mouse over, I see that's really a decimal 16, right? And then we are going to load Y with zero the same way. That number sign right there means uh, immediate mode. I and Y means to increment Y. Because these are 8-bit registers, if this was sitting at 255 and we incremented it, we'd wrap around a zero. Like if we decremented from zero, we'd wrap back around to 255. So what the CPY is doing is it is comparing Y against the constant value 5. Uh, behind the scenes comparison performs the subtraction. The result is thrown away, but the result sets the processor flags. If the values are the same, the result of the subtraction would be 0. So that means the Z flag, the 0 flag, would be set to 1. And a B and E means a branch is not going to be taken if it's not equal or if it's not 0, meaning if the branch Z flag is not set. So on, say, the first loop through, y would be 0. So 0 minus 5 is not a 0 result. So we would take the branch and continue to loop. So you can really say this is branch for as long as it's not equal to 5. So I could right-click this and say, uh, let's put a comment. And let's put this comment on the end of the line and say, branch if y is not 5, if I wanted to be explicit about it. It's up to the person doing the analysis to know which instructions are affected by flags and which flags are affected by instructions. However, you can always right click and get an instruction info and see the flag uh, interaction. So I could click this and say instruction info and see you know, what, the, what its inputs are, uh, what it might be changing in terms of flags or registers. And as we'll see later on, processor instructions are converted by Ghidra into P code. P code that's the same for any kind of processor. We can view the P code as another means of seeing how instructions work. If I go up here to this edit listing fields, these are all the fields that are going to show up in my listing area. If I click on one, it'll automatically highlight it up here so you can see what they're called. This P code is not turned on, so I'm going to right click this and say enable field. And then we can see all this weird P code behind the scenes to understand what it's actually doing when those instructions are there. We're going to look at that more later. Uh, that's rather verbose, so I'm going to turn that back off. Uh, if you ever decide that a field is not wide enough, you can adjust its length just by dragging its little bar there. Okay, I'm going to close that. So as you might have guessed, dex decrements the X register by one. 
And then we have another branch of not equal, which is going to be um, referring to the most recent thing that happened. There's no compare there first. And why is that? Well, if you reach zero, you automatically set the zero flag. There's no need to compare zero with zero to set a zero flag. And once we're all done, this RTS is going to be returned from subroutine. So since we're dealing with assembly that was written, well, in assembly, not some higher level language, I'm not going to be showcasing the decompiler very much. But I do want to show that because you will be using that lots in other contexts. So I go up here to decompiler and um, there's our decompile code. You can see it gave the registers uh, variable names. Just ignore the fact that it chose to create car types for the registers. Uh, but you can see the nested logic is right here. And these windows listen to each other. So if I highlight a section of code in one, I get um, the highlight in the other. So often that's very useful. Uh, another nice way to look at this data is with the function graph. So I can go to window and say function graph. There is the function graph. It's, it's just another way to visually decompose the flow so you can understand what's going on. But I won't be using that much either. But again, in other contexts, that can be very handy. So that's all the background we need right now for 6502 assembly and basic Ghidra usage. Uh, let's move on to the protection schemes. So back in the 1980s, software came in physical boxes and the physical boxes would contain five and a quarter inch floppy disks that generally had some kind of copy protection on it to keep you from duplicating the software. Copy protection involved floppy disk data patterns that you could read easily or respond to on your home drive, but you could not write with your home drive. And that asymmetry was at the heart of the protection scheme. And these protection schemes would be processed by the loader code for the program that was generally designed to resist analysis for obvious reasons. And so for this talk, I wanted to get some Goldilocks examples to look at. I didn't want to look at things that were too easy, like as a simple check for a disk read error, uh, which the early copy programs couldn't reproduce. But I certainly didn't want something too difficult. And wow, there's a lot of difficult stuff out there. Um, people were really clever back in the day. You would have complex, uh, complex obfuscation, like they would take streams of numbers that came from exact cycle timings from IO chips and from uh, other sources like the disk drive, and you know, obfuscate with that or use some custom P code they made or lots of illegal instruction usage or use some other high level language like fourth that's very stack based to confuse you or other kinds of complex flow controls based on interrupts or stack manipulations. There's all kinds of variations out there. I also want to avoid waiting through custom fast loader code. They would basically um, sort of abuse the protocols and the serial lines in unconventional ways with exact timing to make things go much faster. And I also wanted to avoid the uh, unconventional track and sector layouts, you know, like changing your bit rates of writing within a track or sector. Uh, I needed something simple enough for the talk. So I ended up with two games that were just right on the Goldilocks difficulty scale. Got Robots of Dawn there on the left and Bride of Frankenstein on the right. I was able to make these selections based on copy protection analysis notes that were written long, long ago by Dr. Marcus Brenner. Uh, for Robot Sedan and Nate Larson for Bride of Frankenstein. Thank you to those guys for leaving those notes. Robot Sedan is a well-known text adventure game by Epics in 1984. It's based on an Isaac Asimov book from the same name published in 83. Bride of Frankenstein is something obscure that none of my 8-bit friends have heard of. But we're going to be looking at both of these in this talk and see how well these programs can resist analysis tools that were made 35 years later. So that is a visualization of a floppy disk. A floppy disk is a, it's this square flat form factor with a disk inside of magnetically coated mylar and it spins. Maybe you've never even seen one, <clears throat> but the data is stored in circular tracks partitioned into sectors. The bit representation on it is just changes in the polarity over time. And if you have 10 or more cons consecutive ones in a row, that is a sync mark. That's a special signal to the drive saying, hey, there's a sector header coming up or a sector uh, data block coming up. And the data is GCR encoded, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But first, I want to say thank you to Jim Drew. He built this disk image visualizer tool when he heard I was going to be talking about this. And you can see that on there on the right. You can see white colors, runs of ones, and um, you know the green is the, 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 is the value of the byte from 0 to 255 on how intense the green is. That uh, red track is just a marker. That's track 18. That's a special track on Commodores for where the directories are stored. So GCR, this is how a lot of magnetic media was encoded back in the day. I'm going to encode the word whatever. So I have 10 GCR encoded bytes up there. I break them into five bit groups. Each of those five bit groups can be converted to a nibble and those nibbles come together to make bytes. And in this case, the bytes decoded to ASCII or on the Commodore, it's called Petsky. And you can see the word is whatever there. And what this scheme is doing is it's ensuring that the data on the disk never has more than two zeros in a row and never has more than eight consecutive ones in a row. 
Uh, you don't want the more than two zeros in a row because you get a loss of framing and the drive will start to return random data. Although there was copy protection schemes based on this. You put a bunch of zeros in a row and then every time you read that, you'd want to see a different random result. And if the result was fixed, well, you know it was a copy that made that fixed in place. And there was even some copy protection schemes that would try to make many, many ones in a row by creating a custom GCR and a custom DOS where it would, some of them would have no syncs, some of them would have all syncs. But again, I'll be avoiding those more complicated schemes in this talk. So here's what a sector looks like on track one, the outermost track. You can see the read direction right there. And so the first thing you're going to hit for a sector is the header block. And the only important parts on there for this talk is it has the sector number and track number on it. And then you hit the data block, which holds the 256 bytes in that sector. So you can't ask Ghidra to control a Commodore floppy drive in real time. So first we need to make an image file of the floppy disk to study that and load that into Ghidra. And there's different formats. Uh, at the top of this chart, the highest level of fidelity is the flux capture. It's this uninterpreted stream of bits from the disk, and there's no notion of GCR. And at the bottom, the lowest level of fidelity, you have D64 files, which are fully decoded data. There's no more GCR left in that, uh, but it loses how it was originally laid on the floppy because it's just the facts. In the middle is the G64 files. He's tried to preserve as much of the nuance in the data representation as possible on the original floppy but it's still available for emulators to be mounted and use it, and they can uh, reproduce a lot of the copy protections. That's the format we're gonna be looking at. There's a really useful tool called Directory Master on Windows that will allow us to view these G64 image files and both to import and export files uh, from them. That's how we'll be getting the data into Ghidra. So first up is going to be Robots of Dawn. Um, this is my copy of Robots of Dawn. I just very recently broke the shrink wrap on this copy. It had never been opened before. Even though it was shrink wrapped, there was mold on the disk that I had to clean off before I could actually get a good data dump from it because these things do age. They need to be preserved or they're going to disappear. So that's my disk there in the middle. There is a PC floppy drive that I put it into there on the right. That's from the PC era. It's a, it's a high density drive. Above that is something called a SuperCard Pro device that will drive that drive to grab all the data off and create a flux image and a G64 image on my laptop that is over there on the left. And after that was done, I took that image and loaded an emulator, and sure enough, I get past the copy protection successfully, and that's the boot screen. So everything worked. The Robots of Dawn disk directory is a little weird. First of all, background for those who don't know, in a Commodore 64, that's what those blue screens are. That's what it looks like when you boot up a Commodore 64. Yes, it's only 40 characters across. They came from a simpler time. And when you would load a directory, that load dollar sign comma eight, it would load the disk directory as a basic file, a basic programming language file, and you'd have to type list, which you normally type to display a basic file. But in this case, it would display the directory. That doesn't work in Robots of Dawn case. You can see on the right, all you get is Robots of Dawn when you list it because they've obfuscated the directory. Now with modern tools like Directory Master that you see there on the bottom, you can see that, oh, they embedded a clear screen control character. That's why the screen cleared. And they embedded three zeros in a row, which causes a basic listing to terminate. And that's why we didn't get to see the rest of it. So our, our ground truth is going to be this modern Windows tool. And we can actually take those files there and just drag them out onto the file system and then drag them directly into Ghidra. Looking at that very first file on there, we can see it just loads the second file. So we're going to ignore the first file. The second file is called loader. And what we can see in that SYS, that means start execution at. 2304, which is hex 900. So that's where the entry point is. If we open up this file in a hex editor, we can see the first two bytes are 00 and then 09. That's Little Indian, which means you have to flip the order. So that's hex 900, which means its load address into memory is hex 900. So in the case of this file, both the entry point and the load address are the same, hex 900. Okay, let's extract the loader file from the G64 image and import it into Ghidra. So here's a loader, here's the loader file, and let's start Ghidra. Okay, let's make a new folder. <clears throat> Robots of Dawn. Okay, and let's bring the loader in. We're going to go uh, set the language to 6502. <clears throat> go in here in options, call this uh, loader. The base address, as we know, is 900 in hex. Uh, the file offset is 2 because we have to skip the first two bytes uh, for the load address. And then it gives me this little warning saying, hey, the file's too long, set it to this value instead. So let's just 
do what it says, and now it's happy. Press OK, and we press OK. And sorry, I need to scrunch this up again to within the visual display. And let's bring it in. Yes, we're going to analyze. It's only 299 bytes long. That's not too long. And just see if anything stands out. Um, sorry, I went through the uh, stack first. Uh, there is definitely some characters here at the bottom. So these are files that we saw um, earlier in the file system display. I'm going to turn these into strings. So that was one of the file names. And I'm going to say data. And I'm going to say select string type. Sorry, that goes below the screen. And I'm going to do this again for robots1. and for this other file name. There we go. So then if anything points to it, it'll uh, give the name as it goes along. So let's select all, and we're gonna disassemble. And go back up here. So where does 900 start? There we go. And there's some code. So you can see that from 900 to 90 E looks like sensible code here. After that is gobbledygook. Oh, by the way, when you see these red addresses here, uh, that's because it belongs to a code block that we don't have. It's, it's outside of our defined memory. The, the green addresses mean it's, it's within our, our memory. Let's take a look at these instructions. As you remember, LDY loads the Y register. Uh, LDA is also a load. This is for the accumulator. This one doesn't have that number sign in front of it, which means we are loading a value stored at a memory location. It's not immediate mode anymore. It's going to load the value from hex 901, comma y. The comma y means that we add the value of y register as an offset to the memory location prior to retrieving this value. The equals greater than lab designation you see over here is put in from Ghidra. I wish this comma y was in green because it really is part of the instruction. Uh, the equal greater than lab that is just annotation from Ghidra. That's not actually part of the 6502 instruction. This plus one here, by the way, is a cross-reference. That means it's going to be acting on an operand instead of the operator down below. So this EOR, that is 6502 speak for exclusive OR. And so we load an address, and then we exclusive OR it with, the, with an adjacent address, and then we store the modified value right back into the original address. So it looks like we've hit an XOR data deobfuscation loop right off the bat. We increment the Y register and compare it to the immediate value of B7. And you can see from the branching instruction here, this is only two bytes. The second byte is a signed offset, this 22 right there. And that shows how far to branch forward or backwards. And seven bits can't branch very far. Uh, but it's usually sufficient for given how compact 6502 instructions are. Now, this, this branch is off down below to 932, but that's down to the gobbledygook section. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out if we look at the cross-references, look at all these cross-references for this line, we can see this right right here means that an instruction at address 0908, that's right here, is changing this branch destination. So above, we initialize Y with OE. Um, sorry, with E. And then we look at the memory location 90, hex 901 plus Y, which is 090F, which is this operand here. Not the instruction, but the operand, the offset address. So the second half of this branch instruction in the deobfuscation loop is going to be deobfuscated by the very loop doing the deobfuscation. You don't normally see something like that. It's kind of amusing. So doing deobfuscation manually is the path to madness, but let's do this one byte manually because then we can see the entire loop clearly to see um, what it works. I think you probably know what it does, but let's do it anyway. Um, I'm gonna open the Windows calculator and I'm gonna go up here and set this to programmer. Look at that, I bet you didn't know you could do that. And I'm gonna do a hex 22, uh, hex mode 22, and I'm gonna choose an XOR with D0. So that's F2, and that's what this branch address is going to be set to. Now, the eighth bit is set. That means this is a negative number. So if I say like F2 minus FF, I can see this is negative 13. 
So that means it's going to be branching backwards 13 bytes. And that's what makes the loop work. So let's let's actually carry that out to show you that we can make changes on code that we have here. I'm going to clear the code bytes on this line because you actually can't change it when an instruction is defined. And you can right clear, uh, click and say uh, clear code bytes or you just press the letter C. And now I'm going to uh, go over here into the bytes panel that I showed you a little bit earlier. I'm going to find this particular byte just by clicking on it. Whoops, wrong byte. That byte. And I can't make modifications unless I go up here and click this, and that turns the cursor red. And I'm going to change that 22 to the F2. We just calculated. And now I'm going to close this, and I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to re-disassemble this area. And now we have a branch that goes to 0902, and you can see the little flow error over here. So the very first byte it deobfuscates repairs that loop. So it's time to do some scripting, uh, since we don't want to figure out all of this deobfuscation manually. Let's write some Python to automate what that loop does. And I'm going to go up here to Window and choose Python. And that's going to give me a scripting window, which we're going to write some code in. Um, Ghidra has an extensive set of APIs. You're going to be spending a lot of time searching through them, but it's worth it because they are frequently exactly what you need. So when you first start exploring Ghidra's APIs, I recommend looking at the flat program API. This API exposes methods from all across the depths of the API in one big fat class. Your JSON uh, scripts will get these imports by default. We're going to see that. Uh, and the flat API is intended to be forward compatible for scripts, meaning that they, they don't want to change this API very much, but they feel more free to change the API calls that are underneath it. I should mention that all of the API documentation is distributed with your Ghidra install and it's also available online. So the first thing we're going to need to do though before we do this is to undo that change we made. Ghidra has undo, which is great. Uh, I think. Well, let me just hit Control Z instead. I don't know where the option is. Control Z, Control Z. There. I'm back to where we were because it's going to be looking at adjacent bytes and we've thrown off that, that adjacent byte pattern. So we needed to fix that before doing the deobfuscation. So here we are in the Python uh, REPL shell. And what I'm going to do first is create an address range that we want to deobfuscate. Okay. And let's define the address range. So we're going to say it's from, we're going to say to address, because we need to turn a number into an address instance. So that was our hex address plus the loop offset when we initialized it. And we're going to go to address um, exclusive endpoint. Let me see if I got that right. Um, yeah, that looks right. So there's a defined address range. And if we want to see what that looks like as an instance, we can just um, ask. Either that or just say that. Okay. So for address in AR. Oh, I need to clear the code bytes first. Um, let's clear listing. Remember, we, we can't change the values that they've already been defined as instructions or strings or any other thing. So I'm going to say clear listing. I could do this in the GUI, I'm just going to do it from the command line here. This address range, uh, for whatever reason, clear listing doesn't accept a range. You have to give it two endpoints. So I'm just going to pull these out. There we go. And I don't know if you can see behind the scenes, but the, the, the GUI reflected that. It was listening. Okay, so now I'm going to say for address in address range, I'm going to set the byte address to the value of the address XOR with the address that was right before it. Did I get my princey count correct? Let's see. Yeah. And I think that probably worked. Let's see. Let's go back into here and highlight everything and say, whoops, oh, not over there. Go away. I'm going to go over here, highlight everything, disassemble. And I have sensible code. So we have gotten through that layer of obfuscation. So that's a bunch of new code to understand. Uh, however, we can make things easier on ourselves by automatically 
commenting much of it. So some background real quick. In early computing days, you were much closer to the hardware than you generally are today. So you need to know where the I.O. registers were, how they were mapped to memory, where the ROM routines were, how they were mapped into the memory space. So I wrote a script that does all of that and will comment our code with all of those references for us. The Python window is just a, for quick one-off scripts, as you just saw. Uh, normally you write standalone scripts so they can be reused easily over and over, and you can even prompt the user for values to type in. So these scripts are all here. This is the script manager. You can see I've already filtered it for Commodore 64. These are some of the scripts I made. If I didn't do that, there's a lot of scripts. These are ones I've made for this talk. And you, you want to just make sure to go up here to tell the script manager what directories to look for uh, for your scripts. So the one we are concerning ourselves with is this uh, C64 label addresses. This will make the code far easier to read. So let's do a quick code walkthrough on this. So I made these scripts in Visual Studio Code. You can do them in any IDE or text editor that you want. Here is this script. And so you can see by a lot of these yellow underlines that this particular IDE is not resolving the Ghidra APIs. Um, that's just because I'm lazy here. I don't need it. Later on, I'll show you a more integrated Ghidra and IDA approach that can handle this. Ghidra likes to work with Eclipse normally, and I'll be using that later on when it's not scripts. This code is mostly just a bunch of descriptions of mapped memory locations. I created these long lists from web pages online that just transformed with regexes into these Python dictionaries and tuples. Uh, and these are a lot of particulars you wouldn't want to commit to memory. Here's a bunch of labels for ROM addresses, labels for RAM addresses used by the kernel. Uh, this are the ROM basic uh, calls. Uh, this is the basic memory locations that are used in RAM. <clears throat> uh, these are the I.O. registers and where they're mapped to. And also, since the 1541 is its own processor, the Commodore disk drive, I have its ROM routines, because we're going to need these later, as well as the RAM addresses that that uses. So just a bunch of boilerplate, but it's really going to help. So all these scripts have a run method. That's the only method you really have to implement. And so I basically say, let's get the memory of this current program. I look at the selection. If the user had selected just a range of instructions in Ghidra, that's the selection that this would be applied to. But if not, I'm going to get the entire program's range. And then I can set up these choices and ask. This ask for choices presents to the user different options they can pick for what they want to have labeled. Then I just after finished after finished asking all these, you know, yes, no questions and many, many choices or just single choice. I then will iterate over this range address. And for each one of these things, I'm going to get instruction and I will look up this the address that's referenced either because the instruction sits there or because it's the argument of the instruction. I can get that value out of all those tables that I set up so I can give it a textual description either by renaming the label of the address or by making an end line uh, comment. So yeah, that's that's all this does is apply those labels. And I'll make this code available so you can look at it in more detail. And I have some little helper methods here. Like you saw me make an end of line comment earlier. Here's how you would do it in code instead. So it's all really relatively straightforward. So let's highlight where we want to apply this. I'm going to start at 900 and come down to oh let's do about here because you can see from the flows that it doesn't jump this jumps and it doesn't jump away from that point so let's label all of this so i go up to the scripts and i say label addresses i'm going to choose commodore addresses not floppy drive addresses i'm going to let's just do kernel rom calls uh, basic rom calls and io registers we'll do that and I can choose whether to make, let's, let's do end of line description comments. And I'm more interested in the addresses that are in the operands than the addresses that the instructions happen to find themselves at. And I click OK. And all of a sudden, I have a bunch of documentation over here on the right. So when looking over here, you can see there's lots of file I.O. where opening closing channels and setting file names and, you know, doing stuff like that. Uh, that's I. I don't want you to get all caught up in, I don't want to get all caught up in the minutia of all of this. So I'm going to give a high level perspective of the disk drive IO calls 
And once I do that, we'll ignore all the details moving forward and just get to the meat of the copy protection. Okay, so here's the crash course. And if this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. Just trying to get us familiar with a CBM, Commodore Business Machine, DOS calls. The loader code is going to contain many kernel calls. You're going to see that. Yes, kernel is spelled with an A, not an E, for Commodore historical reasons. Uh, you saw the script that can identify these things. Here's an example of loading a file from a disk. There's going to be some routine they call. You don't have to memorize the numbers. That will set the file name. Uh, the accumulator is going to be the length of the file name, and the X and Y holds the 16-bit address of the string. This looks like system calls for any kind of low-level you know, in, when you're using the old DOS interrupts, is very kind of similar. In Commodore land, you set something called a file number, a device number, and a channel number. The file number is the number on the Commodore 64 side to keep track of this open channel. The channel number is on the floppy drive side to keep track of it. And the device number is which floppy drive you're talking to. You can have up to four. They can be number eight, nine, 10, 11. It's almost always eight. And then another call there would simply load the file. Again, you don't have to know any of these specifics, but that's what a pattern could look like. What we're going to be concerned with is something called direct access commands. This gives you a lower level access to the drive to do more specialized things that copy protection routines would need. There's four of interest here. One is the block read command, which is which you would see as the string U1, uh, followed by you know channel, track, and sector, and things like this. Then you can get a byte at a time from that. You can do a command called memory read. The string for that is M-R. This reads bytes out of the RAM or ROM of the floppy drive, and you can get them a byte at a time. There's uh, memory write. This allows us to push data directly into 1541's RAM. That looks like an M-W. And then there's a memory execute, that M-E, that allows you to kick off code that you maybe had written to the, the drive to do specialized things. Uh, this kind of strings, these code, is almost always obfuscated to prevent people from just searching for them right off the bat and figuring out where the relevant drive commands are for the copy protection. Uh, one last example is sometimes you see these channels uh, used in combination. You'll, you'll have a uh, command channel paired with a data channel. So you may create a data channel to retrieve data from the disk drive's RAM, and that has a file name of just number sign, just to designate that. And then you create a command channel to command the drive to get some information, and then you can read that information out of the drive, and then you end up closing both of those channels. And um, these are the higher level calls. These are actually higher level calls. There's even lower level calls that do talk and listen and things like this. But those are the patterns we're going to see. And that's about the last level of detail I'm going to go into them. I'm just more interested in what actually happens than what the calls are. So that's the end of this overview. Okay, so back to the code. This section here is basically opening a 1541 command channel like we just talked about for anybody that knows Commodore basic that's like an open 15 comma 8 comma 15 and then this next section here you can see the file name is getting set and there's just one character and that character is a hex 23 which is a number sign that's a an indication that this is a direct access channel that we just talked about with the slides this is the basic equivalent of open 3 comma 8 comma 3 number sign. These, these addresses that are in red here, again, that's just because they are not referring to memory locations that we have defined in our memory map. That is not a problem at all. If that was bothersome, we could always load in the basic and the kernel ROMs into this project, but I think that's overkill. And looking down from here down to here, uh, what we have here is code relocation. Uh, unlike other assembly languages, there is no memory range copy command in 6502 assembly, so you always have to write your own. And this puts um, hex 340 into FBFC down in zero page, and that's going to be the destination address for copying 103 bytes. That's what this hex 66 is right here. That says 102. I think it's 103 based on how we branch. So. This compare is kind of strange right here that it does for the loop. It checks for an underflow to see if we are at zero and decremented and ending up at 255. I mean, they could have saved an instruction by removing that copy completely and just changing this branch of not equal to zero to a BMI, which is a branch if the negative is uh, set. But um, <clears throat> either way, this jump right here is an indirect jump. That address FB will still hold uh, 340, so that's where it's going to go. Uh, there's really no reason to set up this vector and do an indirect jump to it. A direct jump would have done just fine, so who knows why. So let's use uh, this code relocation as another excuse to use the Python REPL window and see more of the API. So first I'm going to get the memory. So Whoops. 
I called that meme. Oh well, meme it is. And memory block is going to be, I guess, meme. I meant to put mem. We'll call this new block relate, uh, relocated code. <clears throat> and we'll make an address instance of it um, at 0340 and 103 bytes. These will initialize to 0. And we'll put false there. What, what false is, is false means that this is not going to be an overlay. An overlay means it would be overlapping with addresses that we already have in our memory map. So we would need a new space, but that didn't happen here. That will be happening later, though. So let's uh, set permissions on this memory block. <clears throat> set write as well. And let's set execute while we're here. There we go. Uh, execute, execute. There we go. All of these should always be set to true because the Commodore 64 doesn't have a memory management unit. It is von Neumann AF. Okay, so let's make uh, an iteration over this range. <clears throat> wow, I'm making all kinds of typos. There we go. So this is where we're coming from. And we're going to get byte. Sorry, that's where we're going to. This is where we're coming from. Okay, and that executes the loop. We could have done all this with the GUI as well, and I will be doing a move like this with the GUI a little bit later on, but I just want to show the scripting approach because as I've discovered, Ghidra is more useful to me once I start treating it like a development framework. Uh, if you wanted, you can now go back into this loader code and you know collapse that range as an array or, or something so that you don't have to look at it anymore as a way to reduce cognitive burden. I don't think Ghidra just has a way to let you outright delete bytes. If it does, I don't know what it is. But we're not going to do that. The last time we started with a new chunk of code, though, we looked through the bytes for strings, and we did that manually. So I want to let Ghidra do that for us automatically this time. So let's go to this new relocate code. And I'm going to go search and say for strings. Now, I'm not going to require null. Um, let's make the max length just down to three. And there's a word model right here that it's going to use. This is something you don't normally look at, but let's just take a peek at that. So let's go into Ghidra here and go into features base, data, and string engrams. Now I'm going to open up a notepad, and uh, let's see. Let's just bring that into the notepad. Oh, that may have been a bad way to do that. Oh, nope, it's not. Okay. So you can see this model that it uses to find strings it looks like it's a histogram of engrams where n is equal to 3. I can look down here and see something, something, something with a count of how many times that occurred in their corpuses. Uh, is that the plural of corpus? So, and the corpus, um, the, where, they, where they built it on is all explicitly stated up here. So it might be easy to make your own string identifier histogram if you wanted. I've never tried that. But knock yourself out. Okay. So back to Ghidra. Uh, let's search for these. And what we see is one of these u1 commands that I talked about in the slides. So that string right there, if you look at it, the 3 is a channel number, and then the 21 is a track number, and the 3 is a sector number. Those, those are fixed in the string. Those are not computed values. So that's a hint that they're probably significant for this copy protection. So that's at 0397. Let's go down to where that is. Um, oh, we're right there. Okay, so I'm going to take this and designate that as a string. Okay, and now let's take all this relocated code block and disassemble it.
And then the next thing I want to do is to label all the system calls again. So let's go back into our scripts, label addresses, and do the same thing we've been doing. There we go. So it starts off with a function call, and I can mouse over that to see a preview of where that's going to go. Let's just uh, double click it to go to that function. It's nearby, so this isn't much code. Subroutine calling, of course, is very simple in 6502 land. Uh, in modern architectures like x86, when you're calling a function, you're likely to see lots of stuff being pushed onto the stack, like the subroutine arguments that are being passed, the return address, you have a stack base pointer, then you have uh, the stack pointer gets moved to make space for subroutine local variables and all that kind of stuff. Usually all you do in 6502 land is you just put the return address on the stack, which happens automatically when you call, and then pass state. Uh, the state is passed passively as globals. So this function right here selects the command channel 15 that we set up for output and loops to send that command string to the drive that we just found um, a character at a time. So let's just rename this function here to be read track 21 sector 3. That'll probably do. Okay, let's go back up to where we were after that call. Um, right there. So this is going to grab a byte at a time from the floppy drive from track 21 sector 3. It's going to be putting each byte into the accumulator. We store the incoming bytes starting at hex 900 in the Commodore's RAM. Again, that comma Y means you're going to be adding that index to it, so it increments and puts each byte in the next position. For some reason, though, it stores the byte twice. And that seems like a waste of time to store it twice, but that's a hint of sneakiness that is to come. On the next line here, you can see that it is doing an exclusive OR with it and storing that. Um, this is basically creating an 8-bit rolling checksum. So let's rename this location right here to checksum. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so the Y register is 8 bits, and as I've said repeatedly, if you increment 8 bits and it overflows, you go back around to zero. That's what this is checking for, um, and that makes sense because a sector has 256 bytes in it, so that wraparound makes sense. So let's rename this branch right here to get sector from the floppy drive, the 1541, and that labels it right up there. You can do it from either side, of course. Okay, looking forward, uh, after retrieving the sector and putting it into uh, hex 900, which, by the way, overwrites previous loading code that we looked at earlier, but that doesn't really matter, that checksum is evaluated to see if it is hex 66. And if so, it's going to branch away. But otherwise, it does some self-modifying code. So it's going to load the accumulator with 59 and then store that on 034F. 034F is up here. That is a operator. We're not modifying the operand this time. We're actually modifying the structure itself. So let's call this self-mod. Let's rename this and say self-mod. And let's go up there and make that change. So we're going to take this instruction here in clear bytes. Oh, look at all these cross-references. This is not the only time this is going to be modified. So let's take this and hit C, and then open up the byte editor, which is here. And then we're going to take, it was a 99. So I'm still in edit mode, right? Yes, I am. The cursor is still red, so I can make a change to this byte. We'll be replacing that with 59. Uh, coming back here, closing this, and re-disassembling this and see what we get. Okay, we can see now that that's an exclusive OR. So that first redundant, or sorry, the redundant STA, there was a placeholder to allow the first STA to be able to turn into an XOR instruction instead. Okay, let's head back down to where we were. We had loaded the accumulator with 59. That means the zero flag is clear. Uh, so this branch of not equal is... A, not a conditional branch, it's become basically an unconditional jump. It was pretty common to code this way back in 6502 times because 
If you know for certain what the flag status is going to be, you can save yourself a byte by branching instead of jumping. So it's really not for obfuscation or anything like that. So this is branching to uh, 0340. So it's going to do this read of the sector all over again. Uh, reading sector 21, uh, sorry, track 21, sector 3. So let's rename this. You can call this read sector into 1541 wham or something like that. Okay, so on the second pass, it's going to read track 21 and sector 3 again. But if you XOR down here, those bytes with the previously collected sector bytes, you should turn everything to zero because XORing something with itself is zero. You should end up with 256 byte zeros. And that can't be what we want. They say insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, but it turns out the designers of this protection scheme did something sneaky, and you actually will get different results. Uh, but before I explain uh, what I think is a very clever trick, let's finish reading through this code. So on the second pass, it's a, it's a good guess to assume we don't have all zeros. And this checksum right here uh, will be true. Otherwise, we'd be stuck in some infinite loop. Uh, since all zeros couldn't give us a checksum of hex 66. So, in fact, an infinite loop here is exactly what happens when you do attempt a simple copy of the floppy disk in a low-fidelity way. I know because I tried it and then ran it in an emulator. But that is some kind of success condition. So we're going to come here and rename this label to be uh, done with uh, track 21, sector 3, reads. Because by this point, we've done it twice. Now, looking down a little bit, because that jumps to, where is this, done over here. It's going to do some I.O. Then there's a bit statement. This bit statement doesn't actually do anything, ignore that. But on the next line, it looks like they're going to modify that instruction that we modified yet again. So they're going to be modifying it with 4C. So let's go back up to self-mod. I can just click it to take me there. Go here again, clear the bytes, open up the byte editor. This 59 now becomes 4C. I close this, disassemble, and now we have an absolute jump. So remember, coming down here, we are going to branch. This is a this branch is absolutely going to happen based on the value that's up here to self-mod. You come up here to self-mod, it's not going to read the track in sector again. Instead, it's going to jump to the address that we populated from having read uh, track 21, sector 3, twice and XORing it with itself. In other words, that must have somehow constructed viable code. So it's time to show you what's really going on here, what the trick is. And let me start by opening up Visual Studio Code again. And I'm going to go in here to Util. What I have here is some parsing code that returns decoded data from a G64 image. This heavily borrows from Michael Stiles' uh, Python G64 visualization tool. I just did some hasty modifications to have it return track and sector data instances to me. My mods could use a lot more work to be polished, but it's good enough for this talk. So I made a sector class, uh, which I can populate from the way he parses stuff, and I can pass it back in collections of tracks. This should look like that slide that was shown a while ago on how to do the GCR uh, decoding. There's code in here to be able to handle things a bit at a time, so we can handle things five bits at a time. And then the, the parse G64 is largely like Michael had written it. And so what I do is I call that from this script, and it is going to parse the robots of Dawn G64 and get all the tracks. And as it goes along, if it sees anything weird in the way that the track and sectors uh, numbers are declared in the sector headers, it will tell you that as it goes along. So let me switch to uh, a summary of what happened. Okay, so when you run this code, that first line is going to spit out a bunch of tracks. It says, hey, track 21 sector 18 was labeled as if it was track 21 sector 3. That means there was two separate track 21 sector 3s that could be found on the drive. Simpler copy protections at this time would not have been able to preserve that wrong sector number in the sector headers. So if you made a copy, that wouldn't have been preserved and it would fail the copy protection. This even messed up uh, my Windows Program Directory Master's ability to view the sector correctly. So this, this approach is still given after all these years. So what the code does next is it does a uh, hex dump. It, it grabs 
the legit Track 21 Sector 3 prints out a hex dump and then grabs the illegitimate one, which is uh, Sector 18, and prints out a hex dump. And we can see from those that the real Sector 3 only has the high nibbles, and the fake Sector 3 only has the low nibbles. Well, if you XOR those two together, you're going to get all the nibbles, right? And so that's why there was data there when it's not just all zeros. Jim Drew's uh, disk visualization tool shows this. You can see that the high nibbles there that are circled are closer to 255, so they're darker in color. The low nibbles are closer to zero, so they're lighter in color. And it doesn't look like much of the rest of that track is being used at all. So what my script does is it XORs these together and just saves that file off to disk, which we're going to load into Ghidra. And we're going to need to do this as an overlay because the memory locations that this is going into have already been defined in other blocks. On a commenter, this would just simply overwrite that earlier code. And there's, there's of course, no load address on this either. It wasn't meant, uh, we'll just be injecting this straight into RAM. Okay, I previously generated that hidden code that we're going to load in. So let's do that now. We're going to say file. This time we're going to say add to program to add it to this existing set of memory blocks. I'm going to be loading this combined dot bin. And I am going to go options and say the block name will be combined. The base address is going to be 900. We know that from the code. And it's going to be an overlay. So let's press OK. And sorry, that fell outside the window again. OK. So I can go over here and click Loader, and that will show me all these blocks at once. Let's go find this. It should have a different uh, name spacing. There it is. And we can't read all of that. Remember, we can always go back into this field, click this, and enlarge to be able to read if fields are getting truncated. So uh, I'm just going to disassemble all of that. And I'm going to run our tool again. So tools, sorry, not tools. I'm going to run the script. Okay, so we see some more I.O. here from all this uh, code that was hidden directly on the sector. It's loading, setting a file name. That file name is getting set from A14. I can actually just scroll up to see what that is. The reason why I can scroll up is because addresses are in order, but they're also grouped by overlay, and that's why this is above this. But there's 0A14 right there. That's title screen. So we are now loading the title screen. That means we are past the copy protection. We did it. We found the, the hidden code. I will leave it as an exercise to anyone who's viewing to figure out what the minimum changes would be to remove the protection from the G64 disk image so that the game can just be re represented as conventional files and not direct sector reads. But anyway, that's it for this one. We've seen how the copy protection works. On to our second game, where we'll be creating uh, more customizations to Ghidra along the way to help with analysis, because we'd be doing some things in tedious ways that we need to automate. So this is Bride of Frankenstein, and we're going to start again by looking at the disk directory. You can see this has a obfuscated disk directory, just like the last program we looked at. It uses the same zeros trick to terminate the listing before all the files are displayed. And again, we can see them all clearly with the directory master tool, so that's not a problem. The first file, AS, auto runs when loaded, so that's going to be the first file we export and load into Ghidra. Now, Ghidra was designed to support user extensions that could be selecting binaries from strange file systems. If someone wanted to, they could implement a Ghidra file selector that works on G64 disk images, and then you could just select your file from that. We could also write a custom Ghidra binary loader and exporter to save those files back to G64 images after they're edited. It'd be a lot of work, but Ghidra is designed to extend for these kinds of workflows. I'm not going to do all that here, but I did write a custom loader to streamline the binary loading for the rest of the talk. So it was kind of lame to have to open up a hex editor to find the load address for these binaries. So this is what the custom loader looks like. It automatically selects the 6502 architecture. The load address is automatically determined from the file. And there's an easy way to skip or to not skip the first two bytes. A Ghidra binary loader is a simple thing. It doesn't define processor instructions or implement analysis types or anything very complicated. It just exists to process the input file structure and to set up blocks of memory. Now, if you have an ELF or PE file from Linux or Windows, there's lots of segments and file structure there to parse, but C64 binaries don't have any consistent structure you need to parse through. 
So if you're making a custom loader, you can use whatever development environment you like. That said, Ghidra is tightly integrated with Eclipse for developing extensions. So if you're doing anything more than just simple script writing, it's worth installing Eclipse, even if that is not your preferred environment. There's a number of setup steps here to introduce Ghidra to Eclipse, but you only do it once. So let me show you those steps. Uh, in Eclipse, you start by clicking Help and install new software. Uh, then you're going to click Add and then Archive, and then you're going to go into uh, the Ghidra folder and go into Extensions, Eclipse, into Ghidra Dev and find that zip file. For me, it's version 3. Then you click Open. And then you're going to have to say Next and Yes to a lot of things, and Eclipse is going to reboot and just keep saying Yes and Next to things until it is done. So once all that's done, you have a new tab in your Eclipse. It's called Ghidra Dev. From there, go to Preferences and Ghidra Installations. And then go find the Ghidra install directory and let Eclipse know where that is. Then back in Ghidra, if you go to the script manager we saw earlier, there's an Eclipse button there. If you click that, it will edit the script in Eclipse, but not the first time. The first time it's like, well, we need some more setup. So you have to show Ghidra where the Eclipse install directory is and where the workspace is, and it will remember that. This then opens up Eclipse. I'm not sure why I have dark mode in Eclipse for these screenshots. Just ignore that. But you're just going to keep clicking OK and Next and Finish until this side is also done. And then the script opens up in Eclipse, and the next time you click it, it will just open in one step. So Eclipse and Ghidra are now BFFs, and now when you're coding, you have auto-completion on Ghidra APIs, you have integrated debuggers, lots of good stuff like that. So now it's time to create a custom loader in Eclipse. And so you're going to use that new Ghidra Dev tab, click New, and click Ghidra Model Project module project. You give it a name, you click next, and then all of these boxes are going to be checked. Just only allow the loader box to be checked because that's what we're going to, that's what I had built. I'm going to show you. Click finish. And then what you get is a empty template that you start coding in. For instance, you need to override get name. You're going to put whatever your name is, and that's what you're going to do through this empty, a fill in the blanks kind of coding. This talk would be way too long if I pretended to write this coder for you in real time. I've already written it. I'm just going to do a quick walkthrough here in a bit. This fill-in-the-blank template may be sufficient, but sometimes you might want to override methods from other loader parent classes that weren't offered up initially for being overridden. Your loader is going to inherit from abstract program wrapper loader. That comes from abstract program loader, and that comes from loader, and there's interesting things all along the way. If you want to see a code example, you can see the raw binary loader that we used for Robots of Dawn. There is the path to it there. But let's look at the Commodore 64 loader that I made. Okay, so we're here in Eclipse. And here is the loader. So I gave my loader a name here. This is find supported load specs. What this basically means is, should we present this loader to the user for the particular binary that they want to load? And normally there's enough features in the binary that you can tell. It's kind of hard to tell in the Commodore. So I just limited it to if it ends in PRG or bin, or if it's some appropriate Commodore length, then this loader will be offered and the language specification will be set to 6502. Before I look at this load command, let's go and see how we get the options from the user. So, get default options. Okay, so with the scripts we'd done, we had to collect the user inputs uh, one at a time. You saw me click through a bunch of questions and selections, but with the loader, we can ask for lots of these input types all in one window, which is kind of nice. So, do we want to load the first two bytes? Is this an entry address? Is this an overlay? All that kind of stuff. Then below, you need to override the validate options and this is just to make sure these are sanity checks on the input from the user just to make sure they are reasonable <clears throat> and under here i just have some helpers for processing options and doing hex stuff so let's go back up to the load okay in the load here the byte provider is the details about the loaded binary including all the bytes from the binary that i have to see what the load address might be when i look into that the load spec, again, is a language that's going to be 6502. This list is a list of options that the user had selected by this point. It has already passed the user input validation, and now it's time to perform the load. So coming down here, we just make good on the user options first in how we look at the binary, and then we perform the load, which is creating a new initialized block in the memory map that has the file bytes in it. Uh, it's quite straightforward. This stack here that's being created, that's just fixed in memory by the 6502 hardware. The only reason for putting something like this is to keep 
things that are pointing to the stack from turning red uh, if we didn't have the stack, but it's not very important at all. And that's it. So let's look down here a little bit. Um, I like setting all the permissions because that's how it works. So, okay, this create default memory blocks. The 6502 language in Ghidra, for whatever reason, wants to create a zero page, which I don't want, and it wants to create a stack that doesn't have the privileges I want. So I just keep that from happening by just putting return there. This one is going to be important to you, though. This uh, supports loads into program. This will not be an auto-generated stub for you to overwrite in the template. But if you want to load a new file with your loader, that'll work just fine. But you can't just load a new file into an existing program unless this is changed to true. I don't know why you wouldn't want that to be true. I'm sure there is a reason. So that's it. That's how the loader code works. And I'll make it available so you can see it in more detail. As you're working with Eclipse, I recommend that you turn on the automatic builds. So anything that's in your source folder in your workspace will automatically create your class binaries in the bin. Once you're ready to try out your code, you're going to go to run and then do run as, and then you run as Ghidra. And this will bring up an Eclipse controlled Ghidra instance and let you test out your new extension. You can see there's also a debug option above where you can do debug in a Ghidra instance instead. This has all the niceties you'd expect, breakpoints, code stepper, you can examine variables. It's super intuitive. It doesn't require any additional configuration. It just works. Very handy. Uh, after doing this testing, you're going to want to install your new loader into Ghidra so that you can run it there without having to launch Ghidra from Eclipse, of course. So you go to the Ghidra dev tab, you say export, you say export Ghidra, mod or Ghidra module extension. And that Gradle wrapper there, if you have a good online connection, um, you can have all the Gradle build stuff happen for you automatically with the online service. If you don't have that, you'll have to set up that Gradle, but I'm not going to cover that. Then from the Ghidra side, you need to let it know that that extension exists. So you need to install it into Ghidra. The export in Eclipse put this into a dist folder. You can copy that over to the extensions folder if you like, or you can just run it from your Eclipse folder. That's fine too. But either way, start by going file, install extensions, and then you're going to point to where that extension is, and then click OK in the install extensions window. So let's do that last step right now in Ghidra and start using the new loader. OK, back in Ghidra, file and install extensions. I'm going to show it where the Eclipse path is. I'm just going to be lazy and just do it from the Eclipse workspace. Uh, there's my loader, and I press OK, and I have to restart Ghidra. So let's make a new folder. Call this Bride of Frankenstein. And let's go get the boot file. Okay. And so here's our new loader. As you can see, the language is already selected. We're going to go into options. Uh, we don't need to change anything. It already knows our load address. And I'm not going to create the stack this time. So I'm going to press OK and scrunch this down so you can see it. OK. And let's open that up. Analysis. I don't need that Python window open. And let's disassemble everything here. So looking through this, we got a little bit of code. We have a bunch of break statements. Uh, we have a little bit more code, a bunch of break statements, and then some stuff at the bottom. So let's collapse all those breaks so we don't have to look at them. I'm going to start up there, come to here. Whoops, I didn't highlight correctly. I'm sorry. I'm going to say data. Oh, I have to clear the bytes first. So clear code bytes, and then say data, and I'm going to create an array. Just to collapse that. Let's do that again down here. Data create array. Okay. Now looking down here at the bottom, you can see that our starting address 
is represented here three times in Little Indian. So that means those are probably vectors for some reason. So let's change those to a word size. And yes, that is indeed our starting, our load address up here, probably our starting address as well. And we can figure out why that's the case if we see what these areas in RAM do. So let's go over to the label address. We haven't done this yet, where we're going to look at basic and kernel RAM usage. We've only been looking at the ROMs. Let's put it in EOL descriptions. And we're not interested in the operands. We're interested in the addresses themselves. So this is new usage of this. And look at that. These are all vectors, um, pointers, to where certain basic routines are going to be for handling error messages and input line tokenization stuff. At least that's how it's labeled there. So as the commenter finishes loading a file, the basic ROM has a warm start routine that gets called, and the address to that routine is stored at hex 302, right here. Except it isn't anymore, right? So based on the start address of this program, that address at hex 302 got overridden by this program when it loads. So the very act of loading this program hijacks that warm start routine, which allows it to auto start this program. The programmer may not have known exactly which basic vector they needed to hijack, so they just sort of sprayed um, this address across all these different basic vectors. But it's, it's this one right there that does the magic. So let's go ahead and label all the ROM calls as we do up here. Say OK. So we don't have much code here, so let's just start at the top. This here turns the background black. It does some screen blanking, meaning the display goes blank, which slightly decreases load times because the commenter doesn't have to steal cycles to update the screen. Um, then it suppresses some kernel messages, you know, like searching or loading or whatever. Then see, we do a function call here. So that's just slightly below us right here. Um, here's the function. You can see that it has uh, two entry points, an entry point here and an entry point here for the same function. So this is going to load a file. We can tell by the labels that are on here. The accumulator is equal to one. So the file name is going to be one character long and it's going to be located at 02EF. So let's go take a look at 02EF. Uh, that's right here. That's probably not an instruction. So let's clear those bytes. Since the file name is one character long, let's convert this to a character. So data, and say this is a character, and there's a zero. Uh, ASCII for zero or PETSCII for zero. We saw earlier there was a file named zero in the disk image. We also saw there was a file named one in the disk image. And if you look up here on this other entry point, it's going to increment that character, which is going to make it go from ASCII zero to ASCII one. So this routine is going to both load the zero file and the file name named one as well. So let's rename this to file name. So I'm just going to go here, say label, and say file name. Okay. So since it's probably going to be called again soon for file name one, let's go get both of those from the disk image right now. Okay, go into write Frankenstein, get files zero and one, and bring those in. Okay, this time we're going to go file. We're going to say add to program, and we're going to load in zero. Under options, uh, I don't think we need to change any of the options. It's load address is 1C70. We're not going to create a stack again, and press OK. OK. And now let's disassemble everything. OK, so this new code starts off with a small loop. As you remember, you can always immediately see that by the loop indicator over here, the flow indicator. And underneath that, we have what will turn out to be a pointless no-op slide. And then we have gobbledygook again. And if you look up here, we have an XOR in here. So we have yet another XOR deobfuscation loop. So the starting address is going to be 1C90. You can see it here in Little Indian. And it is going to go for 136 bytes. You can see the compare here. 
So instead of removing the XOR in the Python window like we did last time, it's time for more levels of automation, and we're going to use a script. So back in Visual Studio Code, I have a script I wrote for deobfuscating these kinds of things. It's just going to start by getting the memory. Again, it will work on memory you've selected. If you don't select memory, oh no, in this case, you have to select the range. Okay, interesting. Don't know why I coded that way, but there it is. And what it will prompt you for is what you want the hex byte to be. And then it just simply uh, deobfuscates that here. And we'll do a clear listing first in case we forgot to do that. Scripts differ from those Java extensions in that you don't need to build them. You can just change the script on the fly and Ghidra is immediately ready to use it. There's no build process, uh, no install steps or anything like that. It's, it's quick turnaround time. So let's find that script back in Ghidra. You can see it's right there. XOR obfuscation is still common enough today that Ghidra actually includes their own script for that. If I type in uh, XOR, that's the one that comes with Ghidra. Ghidra script uses a set of bytes for the mask. So with Ghidra's plugin, it's more like decrypting a visionaire cipher uh, where the key happens to be known. But in the case of this script right here, it's just going to be simple. Okay, so let's highlight the part we want to deobfuscate. That's going to be from 1C90 to 1D18. All the way down to there. And go into our scripts. Run this and give it the mask 12. And then disassemble. And boom, we got code to look at. So in this new code, we set some values and then we call function 1CEO. So it's 1CE. We call 1CEO. Wow, I can't say that. Double clicking on this takes us to the function and it looks like this function is another deobfuscation loop. So let's rename this to deobfuscate2, something like that. Okay, and scrolling back up to where we were, we can see, hey, this is gonna actually be called at least twice here. Yeah, it's gonna be called twice. So for this call to deobfuscate, it's gonna pass in the address 1d2b, and it's also going to pass in a mask of 20. Uh, so let's label these things here. I'm going to say label and call this deobfuscation start low, because this is how the parameter passing happens. And come here and call this start high. This is the mask value, so let's label this. XOR mask. And if we want to see what this mask looks like, we can right click this and say convert to, sorry, you can't see it, it's under my screen. I'm choosing the option convert and I'm going to choose unsigned binary. So this mask is only going to flip one bit when it does its XOR. This is actually a terrible mask for obfuscating strings since when changing bytes containing letters, it just flips uppercase and lowercase without actually changing the letter. So that's kind of a strange choice. So when we come back to this function, it's starting to look a lot more documented now. So looking at the Y in here, the compared to Y, it's going to uh, loop 177 times. So it's time to call the deobfuscation script again. So let's go in here, run this. Oh, sorry, I have to highlight the part of memory first. That's going to be from 1D to B. Here, down to 1 ddb. Now I go up to here, run the script, and it's going to be that lame mask that just changes one bit. Uh, I was about to click disassemble, but look at that. There's an m-r read command right there that we talked about earlier at 1d7. So let's make that into a string. And scrolling up, there's a memory execute string. So let's make that into a string. 
And look at that, there's a memory write string. Let's make that into a string. So a good hypothesis at this point is that the copy protection code is going to be sent to the floppy drive RAM with the memory write command. And then it's going to be executed with that memory execute command string we saw. Then the results are going to be retrieved back into the Commodore 64 with the memory read command to check and make sure they're valid. So now let's disassemble everything again. Okay, we have a lot more code to look at now. So that was the first call to deobfuscate 2, as we called it, uh, way back up here at 1C9C. So let's look at the second call. The second call that comes right after it, this time is going to start deobfuscating at 1DDD, and the XOR mask is going to be 37 this time. Although there's a slight change to the setup, it's loading the accumulator with EA, and it's going to store that in two places. That's inside the deobfuscating code. So let's go look at that right now. So that was the part that did the compare to B1. And what EA is, is the no-op instructions, the single byte instruction. So let me just put an end of line comment. I'm not going to actually bother to change this instruction. I'm just going to annotate this here and say becomes no-op, no-op. So on the second call to this, the loop is going to continue until y overflows to zero. So it's going to go for 256 iterations. So on the second call through, uh, it's going to go from one DDD to one EDC. Now we don't actually have that many bytes here, so we'll just go up to where it actually does end. But then after doing that, it's going to no longer qualify for this branch of not equal to zero because it's going to be zero when it overflows and then it's going to return. So let's go highlight that range and deobfuscate yet again on 1DDD, let's go all the way down here. 1DDD, uh, I actually have to clear code to get the granularity I want. There, now I can start on 1DDD. And we're just gonna go to the end, uh, which is less than what the whole loop is, but that's okay. Okay, go back into our scripts and run this. And this time our hex byte is 37. Click OK. OK, disassemble everything again. So now we're back to 1CB7 as we're looking through this code. Hopefully our obfuscation days are behind us. 1CB7. 1CB7. There we go. So this is going to call a function 1D2B. Let's double click that. And what this is going to do is pass an address and the number three via registers to whatever this next function is. So let's click on that. So this function here is going to store those three values that were passed. It's going to put the one DDC address that we saw at FB, and it's going to take the number three and store it in a self-modifying code way uh, down here along with a zero. So it's going to turn that into address 300. So let's go make that code change. 1D9D, I'm going to click that. Uh, go here, that's not actually instruction. We're going to clear these code bytes, or it could be instruction. Let's clear it. Let's go into the hex editor. Um, make sure that write mode is on. And this OE here is going to turn to zero. And writing the three does nothing because it's already three. Turn that off. Now, go away. And we will make that into a word to show that that is an address. So back up here to 1D77. This jumps to 1DC3. And we can see in this function there's some kernel calls, so I think we're done with the deobfuscation. It's time to actually run that tool again to label our code for us. So let's go over here and put in our search criteria, label addresses. So this is doing some lower level serial commands to listen and set a secondary address. We're going to move on here. Um, it ends with a jump to a kernel call. Kernel calls end with an RTS. 
So this is just going to return using that kernel calls return, that kernel calls RTS, without providing its own. So that takes us back to where we called from, 1D77. Now we can see this is going to use that memory write I talked about earlier. It's in a loop that sends a command, a character at a time over the serial carrier to the floppy drive to carry out this command. The loop sends six bytes here. So let's see what the other three bytes are after that m-w. So let's go to 1d9a. Okay, so let's clear the bytes, these three bytes that follow. We'll just clear all of this. And we see we have a 0, a 3, and a 20. So the 0003 is little Indian for that address 300, which we saw earlier. So it's going to send this to the drives RAM at hex 300, and it's going to be appending hex 20 or 32 bytes at a time. And the data to be sent is appended to the command, so this is going to happen over and over again in a loop. So once we see that, we can just skip over that. So back up here at 1D87, uh, yeah, this is the loop. It's going to send it from the C64, from address that's stored to FB, which is still 1DDC, and it's going to send to the floppy drive at 300. Uh, that data is code, so let's relocate that code to 300 in an overlay and pretend it's in the disk drive memory before we take a better look at it. Now, last time I used a Python window to do this, but this time I'm going to copy the code using the GUI. So let's go into the memory manager, and I'm going to hit this plus sign. I'm going to call this block name, say, drive. The start address will be 300. The length is 100 bytes. Sorry, uh, it's 256 bytes. That's 100 hex. Comment. No comment. Um, sorry. Uh, let's see. Select overlay. Let's choose execute. We're going to say this is initialized. The initial value will be 0. Uh, let's make this byte mapped, and the source address will be 1ddc. Oh, the overlay got cleared for me. Thanks a lot. Okay. There we go. And now we have our drive code here. So let's disassemble all of this. And now since this is code that's meant to be ran on the disk drive, uh, we are going to label it with special disk drive RAM and ROM annotations. So let's go over to here. This time we're going to choose disk drive. And I'm going to do RAM and ROM usage end of line, and what's in the operands. Okay, so let's see what we got. So the drive kernel stores the track number in memory location 6, so let's rename this here and call this track num. And we see here that the code is initializing that location with 16. Now we have a section here um, that starts with an SEI and a CLI. So what these things do is SEI suspends all interrupts and, and CI allows them to resume again. This usually means we're entering a section of code that deals with interrupts or cannot be disturbed by interrupts. So what's inside here? So a chip in the floppy drive has a timer on it, and that's used to fire off an interrupt every 14.5 milliseconds. And on that interrupt, the disk drive sees that there's a job queued up. And if so, it starts it. This code here is changing that interval to every 8 milliseconds. This is often an indication that some fine control over the disk head positioning is coming up. Now this next line has hex b0. That is the command for doing seeks. And the job is submitted by writing it to memory location 0. How would anybody know this? Well, today you could just Google it. This is how you interact with the hardware. But back in the day, you frequently had to disassemble the ROMs in your floppy drive to figure out how things actually worked and just you know, reverse, reverse, reverse in order to be able to understand. That was the documentation. Then memory location here is going, uh, zero is going to be checked repeatedly until bit seven. That's the negative bit here is being checked, is zero, uh, which means the job is finished. And the other bits from there will be equal to the status. And it's comparing that to one. And if that's one, it, the status is okay. And if not, it calls a function. So let's look at that function. So this function is performing a read-write 
head seek. There's that seek command again, that B0. So let's relabel this part here. This is waiting. Let's call this uh, wait for seek completion. And we'll rename this function to seek to track. Uh, there's a nearly identical function to this right beneath. Almost instruction for instruction. Uh, the only difference is instead of this RTS, it has a jump back to the beginning of all this logic. And you can see from cross references, if you look here, sorry, there's a cross reference, um, and there's a cross reference. So 339 and 351. So 339, that's an error check. And 351, that's another error check. Uh, these both follow error checks. So let's just rename this function here. I think a good guess is to say this is error start over. Okay, back up to 0329. So here we have a command that actually finally we're going to read something off the disk. And we're going to store that this command right here is to read in the sector's header. Remember, the sector's header contains information about the track number and sector number. We saw that in a slide earlier. Then it waits for completion. And then this right here, FE, is a parameter that's going to be passed to this move head by a half of a track. So FE is actually negative 2. It's signed. And so it's going to take a whole step outwards towards the edge of the disk toward track 1. Uh, these manual control of the head stepping will happen on the new timer intervals that we had set earlier. And this is in a loop, so it's going to keep stepping that head progressively towards track one. So we wait for it to complete. And to down here, we've already read the sector header in, as you remember, and that contained the track number and sector number and other things. Now we can get the sector number from that previous read here. You can see that annotated. So memory location here has a special purpose for the DOS kernel, but it's being used in a different way. This code is going to be using it to hold the track number as we decrement, which you can see there. So let's just call this track index. I'm going to label this. Now make a track counter. So what happens with these sector numbers? Uh, it looks like they're going to get stored starting at disk drive RAM location 380 before it decrements the track counter and does more of this looping. Okay, so the code we just walked through here gathers copy protection values. It sweeps from track 16 down to track one. It steps between the tracks at precise timing intervals that it's set to be zero, oh, sorry, eight milliseconds, well, 8.013 milliseconds. And it grabs the sector number that it finds there and it stores this pattern of sector numbers in the disk drive memory from 0381 um, through all the tracks it reads, 03, 8F. And this is the list of magic values that have to be correct for the copy protection to be satisfied. So why is this copy protection? Why would a low fidelity copy of a floppy disk not satisfy this check? Well, let me show you. So the Commodore 1541 floppy drive did not include an index hole sensor. You can see that hole there on the left, and you can see there is a hole in the disk that will appear once per rotation. Without an index hole sensor, the 1541 Commodore floppy disk drives would not have an absolute point of rotational reference to refer to. So when you formatted a disk at home, the first sector of a track could start at any arbitrary point. And that's okay, because it didn't make a difference for normal usage. But what the Bride of Frankenstein did is they aligned at the start of their tracks. So the copy protection check sees if tracks 16 through 1 are aligned by stepping the head across the tracks at a chosen time interval, then sampling the sector numbers it encounters in the headers at each track and recording those. And it's presumably going to check against some list for correctness back in Commodore space. There's many copy protection variations on this theme. For instance, with fat tracks, the same track was written two or more times right next to each other and in alignment. So the read head could step around at random between them and still get the needed data. A low fidelity copy would not be able to reproduce this if it did not have uh, the index hole sensor. So these copy protection numbers are going to overwrite the addresses here at 380. There are some red herring instructions there in the drive payload that were never intended for execution. Those will be overwritten.
Here we are just resetting the drive's timer back so it can function as normal. And this is actually kind of an interesting spot down here. This is code to burn the evidence. It corrupts the copy protection detection code we just looked at by rotating each byte. So if someone looks at the drive's memory after this routine, it'll be much harder to know what happened. So now we're done with the copy protection payload that was sent to the floppy drive. We're going to head back to Commodore 64 land. I'm going to skim past the part where the Commodore instructs the drive to execute the payload and get the results back from it. So heading back to file zero, let's go down here a bit further. So this is where the payload is being instructed to execute inside the drive by the Commodore. And back up here, here's where the Commodore reads the bytes back out of the drive to validate. And we can see down here it's going to store these at hex 5000 in the Commodore memory. Okay, now on to the validation, because it's informative to see what happens when the copy protection fails. So this address right here was actually overwritten by some code that I skimmed over just now. I'm going to just uh, make a comment at the end saying this should be 5000 instead of what we see there. So this is the loop then that contains the code to validate that the sector numbers we got from the drive uh, match a reference list that we have, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, that list is at 1C D0, and there's 14 bytes that it's going to check. So we could take this and rename this to uh, check copy protection valid. And now let's go look at 1C D0. 1C D0 is above us. And down to this here, let's clear those code bytes. And we can see the sector numbers that came through here, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11. So that's what it's going to be comparing against. When a copy protection fails, it takes some kind of action. Uh, occasionally, programs would display text that chewed you out for attempting to copy it. Some would, sometimes they would threaten your hardware, which was largely a lie that's not possible on a C64 very easily. Although there was a game called Karotica, which is famous for punishing copies by moving the drive's read-write head past track 40 where it gets stuck. And if you power cycle your drive, that does not unjam it. So that was kind of devious. However, Bride of Frankenstein just crashes the Commodore, but it carries out that crash in a clever way with an obfuscation trick that's still in use today. And that trick is jumping into the middle of an instruction. So let's look at that. So you can see by the Ghidra cross-reference that if a check fails on a byte, it is going to branch into the middle of this bit instruction here. 1CFF plus 1 is the second byte there. We don't need to understand what the bit instruction does, but just know that it doesn't modify the accumulator, which is set above to zero. It's basically just a no op in this case. However, if you jump into the second byte of the bit test on address 3789, that's just A937 which becomes the command LDA, load the accumulator, with the number 37. That shorter instruction was hidden inside of the larger instruction. So maybe I'll just put a pre-comment here. Comment, and say pre-comment, and say that A937 is LDA 37. Something like that. So we have a comparison here, and if the accumulator is found to contain that number 37, it's going to fall through to 1D08. And this command banks out all the ROMs and the IOs, which will cause a crash when the next interrupt rolls around, since that interrupt will jump to some non-existent code. This crash will happen after a variable amount of time, so it'll happen at different program counter locations, but it will happen. And now this RTS right here basically means we're done. So this takes us all the way back to where we started, Let's go back up to, oh, it's in this original program, uh, B6 here. So we can rename this function to crash if disk is copied. And now this jump 
is that earlier entry point that we talked about that will update the file name to one. And then that is just going to jump to it because the start address of the file name one is C000. I know because I looked. So we have successfully analyzed past the copy protection. Clearly the scheme is straightforward to bypass if we wanted to. Of course, you always need to make sure it's not leaving breadcrumb values behind that the game will later check for. So that was a bit of work to reach the memory write, memory execute, and memory read command strings in the game. Sometimes you just want to go straight to the direct access command code and not understand the context. So I'm going to demonstrate how to find these commands automatically, even when they may be XOR obfuscated with a fixed mask. Let's do this with a custom Ghidra analyzer. So I have one here that I wrote. I'm not going to show you the setup steps, just the final code. So this is a byte analyzer. Um, let me scoot this over so you can read that. And as a byte analyzer, this is care. This cares about analyzing specifically bytes and can be triggered when bytes change. Now we don't need this to trigger on byte changes. So this could have been a script instead, but it's nice to have this analyzer offered when first loading Commodore 64 files. And I wanted an analyzer example for the talk. So that's why I have enabled set defaults here. Um, it will offer itself up as an analyzer if you're in 6502 land and there's no options from the user. This one is pretty simple. The meat of any analyzer is the added method, which I have here. This is called when the requested information type has been added or when a specific area of the program has been requested to be analyzed by highlighting it by the user. So you have byte analyzers, you can have analyzers that happen at the instruction level, um, even ones for just function signatures. So this one's rather simple though. So down here, this is the section here of the code is going to represent each string we're looking for under all 256 XOR mask representations where mask zero is of course unchanged. The strings we're looking for are the command strings up here that you've seen in the talk. I have a few extra ones up here as well. They're pretty short strings, but it won't make too many false positives because binary files in 6502 land can be pretty short as well. And then with all of those, it's going to just use this find bytes method. And if it finds it, it's going to create a new end of line comment and it's going to show you what XOR mask it used. So let's run this from Eclipse without installing it into Ghidra, like I indicated earlier that you could do. We're going to go to run. I'm going to say run as Ghidra. Ghidra starts up, being controlled by Eclipse here. I'm going to load in uh, that file again. Let's put it into the quick overview folder, just reuse that. There we go. And open it up. And it says, do you want to be analyzed? Yes. And now we see the C64 direct uh, access command search. So we're going to add that. Remember, it's turned off by default. Click Analyze. Now over here on the right, you're going to see black bars start to appear. There they are. That right there, those are false positives. But these last three, uh, there's the M-W command string with the Obfuscation mask of 20, remember the bad mask. That one too, the execute, and there's the write. Now, this analyzer wouldn't have worked on Robots of Dawn loader because if you remember that XOR mask is not fixed, but works on adjacent pairs of bytes to change the mask each time. For those and other types of loader code that must deobfuscate themselves before executing, there's another approach worth demonstrating, and that is Ghidra's P code emulation. We're going to emulate the deobfuscation routine in Robots at Dawn and let it automatically untangle itself like it would in the game boot process. This emulation functionality doesn't exist as an option in the Ghidra GUI, but it's straightforward to do in a script. So let's bring in the loader into Quick Overview. And let's disassemble it. So you remember the entry point is 900, and this is that deobfuscation loop. We're going to have the emulation run until the program counter reaches 910 down here, which it will do when the loop is finished. So let's have a look at the script. This emulator script gets a lot of functionality here from Emulator Helper. And let's just scroll through it. Here are the registers and flag names that are in the Ghidra Slay 6502 specification. I'll be showing more of that at the very end of the talk. The class init here will 
do this enable memory write tracking. This keeps track of what memory locations were written to during the emulation process in its address space so that we can reproduce those changes back in our code space in case the code is self-modifying, which it is. In this section here, we have getters and setters for the program counter and stack pointer. This is the method to read the pcode emulator's memory. There's helper functions here to move a, the program counter to the next instruction and block checks to see if they contain a particular address that we want. So before I get into the emulation part, let's get down here to the bottom and dial this in for our task. Our code entry point is 900. We want this to run until it reaches uh, memory location 910. And I'm going to turn on this tolerate mods to data flow. I'll tell you what this workaround hack is that I had to use on this. Okay, let's save that. Let's go back up to the emulation function here. So here is the emulate. At every single step of emulation, it's going to show all of the 6502 registers and flags. And there's a lot of ways that this emulation will stop. If the user cancels it, it will stop. If the program counter falls outside a defined memory, it stops. If the stack underflows, this one is useful. If you have a RTS and you return and there's no more return addresses left on the stack, it will think that it's done and it stops. If you reach the specified address, which we had one specified in this case, it'll stop. Or if it reaches a max number of steps, we didn't specify that. Or if there's no instruction found with the address, well, it just kind of has to stop. Now this tolerate mods to data flow, this is kind of a workaround I had to do because I can't ask for cross-reference information about code that was self-modified if the emulated control flow passes through that self-modified code. It's a, some bug in how the existing Ghidra analyzers are working with my code. So in this situation, I just do without the cross-references, which means I can't automatically ignore calls to code that falls outside of what I have loaded, like ROM addresses, because that would require the references. But that's really not a big deal here. Under most emulation scenarios, you're not going to run into this situation. But in this particular deobfuscation loop, remember, the obfuscation loop is itself partially unobfuscated by itself. Normal deobfuscation loops work on things completely exterior to themselves, but this one is weirder. So anyway, that's the workaround I had to come up with to make it cover this case. So down here, all of the magic happens in this line. Uh, that does the emulator step based on the instruction that updates the program counter, the memory, the stack, and the flags. And that's what you get for free. Uh, I have a section here for handling updating memory. This will see if the emulator memory has changed and potentially apply that to our Ghidra memory map blocks. Normally you would, you would gather up many writes and apply them all at the end, but in my approach here, for better or for worse, it's to apply each byte as it changes. As part of that, I here filter down to just the memory write types that matter to me, and then I attempt to set the bytes. If I get an exception, that could be because I forgot there was, there was already code there, so I clear that listing, and I try again. So let's see this in action. Let's go to our scripts, and this is pcode emulation. Uh, remember, I didn't take the time to user parameterize this like I can. I just hard-coded the values, so it's just going to run here. So let's take a look. It reached the end address and it stopped. You can see at every point along the way that it's showing what the program counter was, what the registers were, what the flags are. Very powerful. Um, this is as it processes every single instruction. There were a lot of steps here. It did 1,015 steps. And let's see if it did its job. I'm going to highlight everything. Say disassemble. And sure enough, there is the code. It deobfuscated itself. That's pretty cool, huh? That's a great Ghidra feature that people online don't seem to be talking about much yet, but it definitely belongs in your toolbox. I'm going to close the talk with one more obfuscation technique that early copy protection schemes would use to trip up disassembler tools, and these kinds of techniques still see some contemporary use. That is, the use of undocumented CPU instructions. Neither of these games we looked at use this approach, but I'd like to show how Ghidra can accommodate modifications to architecture instructions, since even today, People are finding undocumented instructions on more modern chips by using some clever fuzzing, and you might want your disassembler to be extended to work with these kinds of situations. This is what Ghidra's Slay language looks like. Slay provides an abstraction layer that allows code from many CPU architectures to be turned into Ghidra's CPU agnostic P code. It's this P code that the decompiler uses. So if you write a new CPU specification in Slay language, you'll get a decompiler for your efforts. In this example, Slay defines space for the RAM and registers. 
sizes in bytes, so RAM space of size equals 2 means 16-bit addresses. Register space granularity is a byte, so single-bit flags are usually expressed as having a whole byte to themselves. Since they're referred to by name and not addressable, this doesn't matter. It's just easier to process in the way that Slay works. Register definitions overlap one another frequently. For example, the 2-byte program counter that's at hex offset 20, if you look at that, the line under it is also at hex offset 20 and defines overlapping 1-byte low and high program counter values you can access instead, but you're accessing the same thing. Shown on the right, the Gita folks define the 6502 instruction operator byte also acting as a set of overlapping definitions. That OP is the entire byte, but AAA, BBB, and CC are contiguous bit ranges within that same byte, useful for matching groups of related instructions. For example, BBB is going to be either 0 or 2 if it's immediate addressing mode. So that's a useful pattern when constructing instruction definitions that support immediate operands. The operands data and data 8 are for 16 and 8-bit. If 8-bit, it can be an immediate or an address or a signed value for branches. I think it's valuable to learn Slay from simple CPUs prior to tackling modern ones, but that's just my opinion. So let's look at defining the undocumented instruction ALR. There's more details here than I should go into in an introductory talk, but you can see the relatively simple definitions for the AND instruction and the LSR, the logical shift right instruction. The undocumented ALR instruction is a combination of AND with immediate addressing, followed by an LSR with implicit accumulator addressing. AND in immediate mode addressing takes the operand value and ANDs it with what's in the accumulator, then uses that results flag call right there to set the negative and zero flags based on the new accumulator value. So if it's zero, the zero flag gets set, right? Uh, LSR in the accumulator addressing mode shifts the accumulator right, that drops a bit off the end, which goes into the carry flag, and then the negative and zero flags are again based on the accumulator result. So in our ALR implementation, we only have to pattern match on the exact instruction byte 4b, you can see there on the right, since there's only a single addressing mode available for it. It's a simple one. We don't need the generality with which we can match many different addressing modes. Then we perform the AND logic, ignoring what it would do with the N and Z flags since they're about to be overridden by the LSR logic that it also contains. This unintended instruction actually exists on all 6502 chips and many members of the, that CPU family, and soon Ghidra is going to understand it as well. So going into Ghidra, we're going to go into processors, 6502, data, languages, and there is our slay specification. I'm going to make a backup of this first. And let's edit this file. So this is the 652, 6502 specification. And Let's put our new instruction, which I'm just going to paste in. I'm not going to type it. Um, let's see, alphabetically, we'll go between these two. And there it is. So now if we go back to Ghidra, let's reboot it. And let's open up one of our test programs here. It doesn't really matter which. Had we made a syntax error, Ghidra would have complained by this point. Then you'd need to open up your .ghidra folder under your user account and look at the application.log file for more details. You can make a correction and try again. If Ghidra didn't successfully compile, it will try to compile again on your next attempt. But if Ghidra did successfully compile, and you make more changes to your slay, Ghidra's not going to see those changes until you quit out and restart. This is the way I've been doing it. There might be a better way. So let's test out our new undocumented opcode. We're going to open up the memory map, make a new block, and just type some assembly directly into it, treating Ghidra like an assembler. So I'm going to click this plus, and call this instruction test. Uh, let's just start it at C000. Doesn't matter where. Do it a length bigger than we need. Uh, we definitely want the execute on here. And we want to say this is initialized to zero. And there's our new block. To enter instructions, we can right click and then say patch instruction, like that. Uh, it will give you some kind of warning, just ignore it. So I'm going to start typing code that I want. 
Now, I don't want to have to right-click every single time, so it's Control-Shift-G that lets you enter. So I'm going to load the accumulator with all bits lit. Does it want that capitalized? Come on. There we go. Control-Shift-G. I'm going to capitalize everything this time. And then I'm going to strip that down to just one bit lit, the rightmost. And then I'm going to shift that to the right, which is going to drop that bit off the end. And that's my test. Now let's do it the other way. Set up the accumulator again. And now use our new instruction. Look, there it is. And pass it the parameter 01. And then let's just return to show that we're done. We'll use that to exit our code. Whoop, it didn't take that. Let me do that again. RTS. Okay. So at the end of this line here, um, A should be equal to zero by this point. Z equal to one and C equal to 1. Let me show you again why. We load it up with all 1 bits, we end it so just the rightmost bit is on, and then we logically shift right, which drops that bit off the side, it goes into the carry, therefore accumulator should be 0, the carry should be equal 1, and since accumulator is equal to 0, the Z flag is going to turn on and become 1. The same thing should happen with our more condensed instructions. I'm just going to put that comment here as well. Okay. Remember I showed you hours ago that you could view P code for instructions. That's more relevant now. So let's just take a quick look at that. Turn this P code on. Let's enable the field. And you can then see what the sleigh turned this into. It's pretty close. It gives you an idea of how the memory space is being used. Okay, let's turn that back off. Well, let's run this. Uh, we have to modify the script, because remember, I didn't take the time to put parameters on the script. That's biting me now. Let's go do that. So back in here, we can go to the bottom. I can turn this to false. Not that it matters. I'm not going to specify an end address. The start address is C000. And it's going to automatically end when it hits that RTS. Remember, I showed you that was one of the end conditions. So save. Let's go back into Ghidra. Not that Ghidra that key drill. In the scripts, run the emulation. And let's see if it worked. So going down here on step number four, yes, we see that the accumulator is zero and that the Z and C flags are set. After we go through our special instruction here, we see that the accumulator is also zero and that those two bits have been set. So, success. So congratulations on getting through this long talk. As you work with Ghidra, you're going to have questions of your own. There are two forums out there with friendly folks. One is the GitHub forum for the Ghidra code base. The other is a Reddit forum for Ghidra. And as you can tell, I'm by no means an expert, but I've hopefully given you some code examples that you can quickly adapt to your own interests. I hope that in addition to introducing you to the Ghidra GUI, that I convince you that it can become far more useful once you start to use it as a development environment. Anytime you have to do something for a third time, try to automate it. I'll put out a GitHub link for all the code shown here. It's only top quality level code. You'll have to clean it up. Big thanks to John Donaldson and Will Callender for giving me a reason to put this talk together. Thank you to Nate Lawson and Marcus Brenner for having left the world detailed notes on these two protection schemes that I showed so that I could quickly assess their suitability for the talk. It was a nice leg up. A big thanks to Jim Drew, who wrote custom software to visualize the floppy disk images for my slide pictures. Hopefully that software will be released soon. He also answered a lot of my questions about disk formatting and copy protection schemes. And as always, thank you to Yuri for letting me play in his Maker Garage where I preserved the floppy images. That's it. Go download Keytrap.